everybody to the November 23rd, just kidding, December 1st Capitola City Council <laughs> meeting. May I have a roll call? Yes. Council Member Bertrand. Councilmember Kaiser. Here. Councilmember Peterson. Present. Vice Mayor Story. Here. Mayor Brooks. Here. Before carrying on to the rest of tonight's agenda, Chloe, would you like to share a few words? Yes, thank you, Mayor Brooks. Welcome to the special Capitola City Council meeting. In accordance with California Senate Bill 361, this meeting is not physically open to the public. Council and staff are meeting via Zoom, and there are several ways for the public to watch and participate. Information on how to join the meeting using Zoom or your landline or mobile phone, along with how to submit public comment during the meeting tonight, is available on our website, cityofcapitola.org, and on the published meeting agenda. The public can also live stream the meeting on our website. As always, the meeting is cablecast live on Charter Communications Cable TV Channel 8 and is being recorded to be rebroadcast at a later time. Our technician tonight is Kingston Rivera. Thank you, Kingston, for being here. And thank you, uh, Mayor Brooks, that's all. Thank you, Chloe, and thank you, Kingston. If you can all please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so we're gonna now move on to our next item for additional materials. Do we have any this evening? Mayor Brooks, yes, we did receive four public comment emails regarding item 5A, the outdoor dining ordinance. In addition, two staff provided items for that same agenda item were received. Uh, there was a survey and a usage data report included um, and distributed earlier this week. Okay, thank you very much. And for uh, any additions and deletions? Great. So now moving on to oral communications. Um, this is this allows time for the member, uh, members of the public to address city council on items not on tonight's agenda. Do you, would anyone from the public like to speak? I do not see anyone with their hands raised on this item, and I don't have any minutes. Okay, great. We'll now move on to staff and city council comments. We'll go ahead and begin with, I'm going to switch it up because I only have one more meeting. I'm going to start with council tonight. I'm just going to go crazy. Council, do, you, do anyone have any comments? Councilmember Bertrand, was that a hand raise or was that a no? That was a comment. Okay, Councilmember Bertrand. Yeah, so I had fun this afternoon walking around um, Capitola and uh, a friend visited me that I used to work with. I uh, hope you don't mind the story because it was kind of great. And he said, you know, my wife comes to buy the Capitola all the time, but I don't know anything about it. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to take you around Capitola and the area in general and show you all the areas that you will enjoy to visit. And um, there's a river walk, I went up to Depot Hill, I did the stairs, which we barely made, went out to the, the wharf and talked to Kalosh, and he heard about all the, the ins and outs of the, the, the bait shop, and, and you know, just had a great time. Of course, went to Gales, and showed him all the neat restaurants, and. Uh, he says, wow, I'm going to come with my wife next time I come to Capitola. So I thought that was a good ending to the story. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Any other council comments? Okay, then, Staff, do you have any comments? Just two items I want to briefly mention. First, I want to apologize to council members, many members of the public who were on the last meeting. We obviously had a technological meltdown. There's a bit of hardware failure in City Hall that really cut our internet and really blew that meeting out of the water. So 
apologize for that. We're on. We've identified the problem and figured out how we can do our best to avoid it moving forward. Secondarily, you may notice that this meeting is being live cast on YouTube. This is part of our transition to our new agenda management software. We're not on the new agenda management software yet, but we're testing it out this meeting. Just wanted to give everyone a heads up. Thanks so much, Jamie. All right, if there's no other staff comments, we'll now go to item 5A, and this is our outdoor dining ordinance. The recommended action as we get started here is to consider planning commission recommendations regarding the draft outdoor dining ordinance and either, and there's two options, provide direction on this draft ordinance and consider a schedule for a first reading and adoption, or introduce by title only waiving further reading of the text and ordinance of the city council of the city of Capitola, repealing and replacing the municipal code and amending the municipal code as listed related to outdoor dining in the public right away. Or number two is to consider options to extend, terminate, or modify the temporary outdoor dining program currently scheduled to end on January 3rd. And I'll go ahead and turn this over for staff for presentation in a second. Council Member Kaiser. Thank you. I do have to recuse because of my employment at Prairie Speech Girls that I have a financial conflict. Thank you. Thanks so much, Council Member Kaiser. We'll see you in a little bit. And now over to staff. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Brooks and Council. Can you see my slide okay? We can. Great. This evening we're going to go over a draft ordinance or two draft ordinances for outdoor dining. This is broken into two items this evening as the mayor introduced. The first is a draft ordinance for a permanent outdoor dining program. And then we'll also be asking for a decision from the city council related to the temporary outdoor dining ordinance, whether or not to, or not ordinance, but emergency order, whether or not to extend it if due to expire on January 3rd, 2022. With that, I'll give a brief overview of our outdoor dining to date. In the spring of 2020, the council had an emergency temporary outdoor use permit order. In April of the following year, 2021, the city council directed staff to develop a program for a permanent outdoor dining program in the village. In June and July, we came to council first with two surveys, one from the public and whether or not there was support for a future outdoor dining program and also the restaurants. And both came back positive in wanting the majority supported a future program for outdoor dining. And then in July, we talked about key program elements the city council would like included in a future ordinance. And they allocated $10,000 for a prototype design. In October, I took the first draft ordinance to the planning commission. At that hearing, they gave initial feedback on the ordinance, but asked that we notice all residents within the village. So we went kind of beyond what you typically do for a draft ordinance. Noticed all the village residents. We also placed public notice on every outdoor dining deck in the village. So, and then they continued the hearing to November 4th. On November 4th, there was good turnout and the planning commission provided input on the draft ordinance. But they recommended essentially to delay the adoption of the ordinance until a prototype design was complete. And within that, there were three significant changes that they made within their recommendations. So the first significant change was to remove the sidewalk dining as included in the ordinance. Also to modify the locations of the street dining. And in terms of timing, as I mentioned, to delay the ordinance until a prototype design is in place. The reason for this was they wanted us to ensure that the best design fits the ordinance. And that angled parking, we look at the design for angled parking, make sure that fits the ordinance. And to ensure that on-site bicycle parking requirement can fit within a future design. One other thing the planning commission brought up at that hearing is with new dining decks throughout the village, they asked that staff at a later date really look at the parking that's associated with the residential parking within the village. Holding without parking permits. 
and whether or not we should be modifying where, what areas of the village people can park in, the residents can park in. So it's not tied directly to this, but a future project. Mm -hmm. um, so before you this evening, there are two ordinances. The first ordinance is the Planning Commission recommendation, which modifies the sidewalk. It removes the sidewalk and modifies locations of street dining. And then the ordinance two, which is the Planning Commission recommendation, um, but it has the original city council direction for the location of sidewalk and street dining. So within the sidewalk dining area, I'll go over the difference between those two ordinances. Uh, ordinance one, the Planning Commission recommendation, removes all sidewalk dining. Ordinance two, um, uh, allows sidewalk dining <laughs> Mixed use neighborhood, mixed use village, community mm -hmm. commercial, and regional commercial zoning districts. And then within the mixed use village, it would be limited to Monterey Avenue and the Wharf. Um, and then for street dining, within the Planning Commission recommendation, it's limited to Esplanade and San Jose. And the Ordinance 2, reflecting the original direction of the council, was it's limited to Esplanade, San Jose Avenue. Capitola Avenue and Monterey Avenue, and the timing is also listed on the slide. Um, the components of the ordinance that are the same between both uh, Ordinance 1 and Ordinance 2 are all listed on the slide. So the number of total parking spaces would be 25. There would be two bicycle parking spaces required for every auto space removed. One thing the Planning Commission added was an option to pay into an in lieu program and to um, identify a future common space for bicycle parking in the village. Um, in regards to sound, the Planning Commission prohibited amplified sound in all music. Um, originally it was just a prohibition, they prohibited amplified sound, but they also added all music. Signs, um, one business identification sign and one menu sign would be allowed, or limited to two square feet. They added guidance for acceptable materials, and they added a new requirement for activated space. Um, there was concern walking through the village team. Many of the spaces not utilized Monday through Friday. Um, so this would require a restaurant to be open a minimum of five days per week and when they're and utilizing those spaces directly set when they're open. Um, new requirements were added for stormwater and utilities. Um, maintenance standards were added related to trash, the upkeep of plants, keeping them alive, and keeping the areas clean. Um, within the administrative policy, it would it now require city council to, audit, to authorize any modifications to the admin policy. And there originally was an allowance for a conditional use permit to have outdoor dining on private property. This section was removed. It, the council would like us to look at that further. I would suggest that we spend more time on that. We're really focused on the outdoor dining decks, and if we're going to look at outdoor dining for private properties, it really needs, uh, needs more staff time to make sure we have the right uh, review criteria in there for future ordinance. Um, so early on, before bringing this to planning commission, um, I worked with the coastal commission, and they reviewed our draft ordinance, and at the how we have it written now that went to planning commission, um, they were in support of, they provided edits and we added their guidelines into the ordinance. Their direction initially was to uh, reduce the overall amount of outdoor dining from the original COVID-19 permits. We had over 50 permits in the village, we're now proposing 25. They also suggested the program be temporary to ensure that the goals were um, within the Coastal Act are met. So they suggested between one and five years, the current draft is for free, and they suggested uh, dedicating funds from outdoor dining to reinvest in coastal access, and that is also included in the draft ordinance. Um, and as I mentioned, there's uh, prototype designs which are proposed as an administrative permit within the new ordinance. Um, the Coastal Commission will allow a blanket coastal development permit that would be applicable to any restaurant utilizing the prototype design. So it would be an administrative approval. Um, the blanket coastal development permit, once we have a prototype design, would have to be approved by the Planning Commission, and then it would be a, 
basically would apply to all properties within the coastal zone. Um, there's also an administrative policy that was drafted and attached to your staff report. The administrative policy provides direction on how the city will lease the right of way. Um, it includes the details of how the space will be managed, the allocation of space through the lottery system, and terms for the lease. Um, so here's an overview of what is in our administrative policy at this time. A lot of it is uh, repetitive from the ordinance, but uh, the lottery system is explained within the admin policy. Uh, the fees are the zero, the current fees would be at zero. We would not provide construction assistance to business, but would provide free um, prototype designs if they choose to use them. Uh, the charge for rent would be $3,400 per parking space per year. Um, encroachment permit terms would be up to three years. The maintenance requirements those, um, are the same as what we have in the draft ordinance, and then safety requirements as well. So um, we went out and in preparation for the last meeting and passed out surveys to all of the restaurants uh, that currently or previously utilized the temporary outdoor dining. We got results from 16 of the 18 restaurants in the village. Uh, and I want to let you know that today one of those results changed because of the new variant that's out there. So originally we had heard from the sandbar, um, they, they, they called today and have changed their mind that they would like to participate. So these are updated findings from what was sent out earlier in the week. But within the temporary program, um, currently participating, there's 11 that responded, and um, all 11 would like to participate. Originally, the sandbar said no, but now they are interested in the extension and continuing to participate. We did not hear from Tacos Moreno on this one. Um, for the permanent program, I've updated this as well. Originally, the sandbar was in the no category, and they moved over to definitely and are interested in three spaces in the future. So in total, for definitely, we got over, we asked, would you participate in a future street dining deck? And if so, how many spaces would you like? And for definitely, we now have a total of 19 spaces, likely. Um, Paradise Grill and Pizza My Heart said likely, but Capitola Wine Bar, um, their response was in between likely and unsure. I moved them over to likely so we would have accurate totals, um, but know that they're between likely and unsure. So, um, and they said three to five units. So I used the higher number just to give you um, the maximum number that might maybe asked for. So they, with those totals, we could be up to 14 for likely, and then I'm sure with Capitola Bar and Grill, Zelda's, and El Toro Bravo. El Toro Bravo didn't list a number of spaces. They're really interested in the sidewalk program. Um, and then Margarita Mill said no. And for the sidewalk dining, we asked, would you participate in a future sidewalk dining program um, in that survey? Um, El Toro Bravo said definitely, and Leaf Dogs on Capitola Avenue said definitely, and then Castagnola Deli said likely. I uh, just want to note that Leaf Dogs Deli, Leaf Dog is located on Capitola Avenue, and right now the draft ordinances do not include Capitola Avenue as sidewalk dining, so if it was the will of the city council, that, that is one item that would have to be amended in the ordinance. Um, so, for next steps, um, your options tonight are to you can provide further direction and modify either of the draft ordinances. If, if the item that you're modifying is something that the Planning Commission has not yet considered, then it would have to go back to Planning Commission for review and recommendation. So for instance, the Reef Dog Valley, if there was a, um, if the City Council wanted us to add that to the sidewalk, Locations that actually was considered by the Planning Commission during their hearing, it would not have to go back to Planning Commission for further review. But if there was something new that you wanted to consider um, that they haven't reviewed, it would have to go back to Planning Commission. Um, your second option is the City Council, your original timing. So you could have, I'm sorry, I 
to about things that they saw things from the last meeting. But um, you could hold your first reading this evening, December 1st, and then your second reading would be December 9th. Um, and then if we move forward with Coastal Commission certification in March, uh, by March, and then a blanket coastal development permit, hopefully by April. Um, and the last option is the Planning Commission recommendation for timing. We could delay action until prototype design is in place and reviewed by the Planning Commission. And like we have a Planning Commission recommendation on the ordinance in April, City Council adoption in May, and then certification uh, mid-summer with a blanket CDP in place by September. So, um, and the, their recommendation is to continue the outdoor dining and temporary permit process through that that adoption process. So this evening, um, I'm not going to reread the recommendation. I do want to let you know that the, the first item we're looking for direction on is the ordinance, followed by direction on what we should do with the temporary outdoor dining program. And I have this slide available for you if you would like it when talking about the different ordinances. Um, and I can type in modifications that you'd like. Um, if, if you'd like, but if that helps. So with that, that concludes my presentation and I'm available for questions. Thanks, Katie. Council Member Peterson. Thank you. So uh, just to clarify, because I know it gets confusing between temporary and permanent, what we're talking about right now is the ordinance for the permanent outdoor dining program, correct? Okay. Correct. Uh, great. Okay, so uh, and considering that different businesses have different numbers of, of spaces that they might be interested in using, and we would be using a lottery program or a lottery system, how would that work? So if we were to draw a business's name from the lottery and they say, I want five spaces, so from there on out, do we let every other business that we draw from that lottery know, okay, now there's only 20 spaces left until we get down to the last two, and then whoever's the last to be drawn, we say, do you want to? Because that's all you get. Is that essentially how that works? Or I'm just trying to determine if it's, if we're giving them the option of how many spaces to choose, then based on a lottery system, eventually the last couple people to be chosen only get what's left. Is that, am I correct in that thinking? You know, I'm going to walk you through an example of the lottery because it is um, it is a little bit different than the way you're explaining it. Okay. Um, I'll share my screen again. So, in in this example, uh, I'm showing that in the first column, the total requested number of spaces was 27. I didn't base these numbers on the, the information we got back from the applicant, the business, so these are just uh, funny numbers that I put together there not accurate at all. So um, the requested number of spaces is 27. And if we had a lottery and the maximum number that we could allocate is 25, in the first round, we would allocate um, up to two spaces per business. So everyone in the first round would get up to two spaces. But if, if my Thai Beach had only requested one space, they could get their one. And then we'd be at 15. Then we hold a next round of lottery in which there's um, only five businesses that are looking for additional spaces at that point. So we would pull and everyone would get one of those five. And then we, at, at that point, we're at 20 and there's seven left, uh, or five left. So then we hold the third lottery, essentially, and um, under this scenario, they each get one more. So the, the uh, in this scenario where Tacos Moreno asked for six, um, they only ended up with four. And real, realistically, they could only ask for five to start off. But so that's how it would it end up. Every round, we'd add another one. Um, let me see. And, and in this example, we show uh, 33 spaces. And so, and there's more that the more than 12 applicants. So in the first round, we only give out one per business. And then in the second round is really when you get that, you can only give out 11. So only start, some restaurants will get two while others will only get one. Got it. Thank you. It does. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I love that you had a slide like ready to explain this question there. <laughs> Um, perfect. Uh, my next question is, how long do we expect uh, construction to take for the prototypes? I know we don't really have everything figured out.
back of those yet, but do we have any kind of baseline assumption of how long we would expect construction of one of those to take? So at, at this point, we're, um, we're hoping to start the design process in January, and I think the design process will at least go to planning commission twice, and then we'll have to have the uh, blanket CDP. So I think we're looking at a couple months for design process. In terms of construction, it's, I, I'm hoping it's within like a month they could be constructed, if not faster. But. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Nightmare story. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Brooks. Uh, and thank you, Katie. Um, I had three questions. Uh, and the first one involves the planning commission request to delay the approval of the ordinance until the prototype design um, are um, created. Um, and I know you, you stated the reason. Um, I wasn't quite sure of the connection between the ordinance and those prototypes design. I thought maybe you could explain how they would ensure, one of the reasons was they would ensure the best design. Um, and, and I didn't quite get how that uh, relates to the ordinance. Um, and also the angled parking um, and how that relates to the ordinance um, and um, and ensure the, uh, the bicycle. Um, so I, I was wondering if you could expand on that and, and also confirm we have the ability to amend the ordinance at some later date um, if we felt it was necessary Use the sure. Um, so, yeah, the planning commission uh, really wanted to make sure we get this ordinance right the first time, and they they wanted us to, um, you know, their recommendation was really to they they were supportive of extending the temporary ordinance uh, or temporary order in order to have a prototype design developed that they could review the ordinance again. So they, one item that was brought up a couple times was the bicycle parking and when the bicycle parking requirement that for each space utilized, each parking space utilized, the restaurant will have to provide two bicycle parking spaces. The bicycle parking spaces can either be located in the street dining deck design. Um, it could also, if they have ample private property, they can put it on their private property. Um, or they can opt in to the in lieu program, which if they didn't want it to utilize part of their dining deck area, they could pay future fee that you need to come up with, depending on where the outdoor the community, outdoor dining, shared parking, or bicycles would be, and figure out what that fee is. They could pay into an in lieu fee to actually have it off site centrally located. So that came up at the second meeting in the option. So it, it kind of, having that option almost, uh, it alleviates that issue of whether or not the design will work with the bicycle uh, in the prototype design because they could always opt into uh, the in parking idea. But um, the planning commission was concerned of how, how would bicycles fit with that requirement two bicycle parking spaces per space. Um, so if there were three parking spaces, they would be required to provide six bicycle parking spaces. Um, so there's concern with that, with eating up the space for the outdoor dining. And then the angled parking is unique um, for Capitola. There's not many areas that are dealing with angled parking and outdoor dining. And it does, um, it, it changes the layout and they just wanted to make sure that the ordinance aligned with it. We really don't have any standards in the ordinance that say that all dining decks have to be at a 90 degree angle or a 45 degree angle to the sidewalk. So there's nothing getting in the way of a future prototype design being angled or at a 90 degree angle. So I don't really think that really inhibits what a future prototype design could be, but they, they were hoping to see the design first just to make sure that it was the best design for the village prior to move the park um, Yeah, and that's, that's Yeah, and, and just to follow up, if 
that stated, uh, our ordinance as it, uh, well, I'll call it ordinance number two, which was the original ordinance. Um, that, uh, well, and it currently in its uh, resubmission provides for, for bicycle parking, it provides for uh, both possible options of being built into the prototype or the in-loop program. Um, so we would have both of those tools available to us once, the once we approve the ordinance. There, there's actually three options for them. They can build them into the dining deck, they can utilize the in-loop, or if they have private property that's available, um, they can also put it within their own private property. Good, excellent. Um, I also wanted to um, just um, a general question about the current um, temporary uh, parklet um, and whether we, do we have uh, insurance uh, requirements and indemnity agreements uh, with the businesses currently? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, yeah, um, I was asking whether um, we currently have insurance requirements and indemnity uh, provisions in our um, temporary parklet program. Yes, so as part of the temporary parklet program, prior to issuing a temporary COVID-19 permit, we required each, um, each restaurant to provide us with um, their insurance documentation identifying the city up to a million dollars, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. that was done for every every outdoor dining spot that was activated. Um, that requirement was in place for even the temporary COVID-19 permit. Yeah. And, and my last question, Katie, uh, is about um, the parking permits for village residents and for um, uh, village business employees, um, and, uh, you know, in our um, two large parking lots behind the city hall. Uh, do we have on the books or currently uh, provided for any kind of review for eliminated parking fees um, for village residents and village employees? I may need assistance from. <laughs> My coworkers. Thank you. Hi. Uh, good evening. Um, I can answer that. Yes, we do. We do have a employee permit parking program that I believe it's it's under ten dollars a month, and I think it's six dollars. That allows them to purchase a permit with the business. So it, it, they have to be an employee there, um, and then what they do is they get that permit and they can park in the in the lower lot, um, and it's just, it's like six dollars a month. Uh -huh. um, Chief Daly, um, does, does that program um, is take into consideration the fact that this parking program will be reducing further the number of parking spaces in the building? Well, this, the program that, that we currently have is put in place prior to that. And right. so it's really to just offset any, uh, we're just trying to really offset any employees that are parking down there to create more parking for the visitors and residents and stuff like that. We offer a similar program with the Junior Guard Parents Club where they get parking as well um, during the summer. Does that program apply to uh, village residents? It does not. So they have a, we have a separate uh, village parking, the resident parking permit program. That's another one that's depending on how, how many off-street parking places that they have and there's a lot of caveats to it. But, that, that's separate. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Hey, and I have one more follow-up, Councilmember um, You had asked about uh, the ability to amend the ordinance in the future, and yes, you um, we can always bring back the amended ordinance if there were any issues between the prototype design and the ordinance was drafted. Excellent. Thanks, David. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. For a quick second. Do keep in mind though that the ordinance requires Coastal Commission certification. So the process to amend the ordinance is it's more complicated than other ordinance amendments. 
Do recall, though, there's also a policy attached to this that sort of implements the ordinance, and the policy can be changed without Coastal Commission review. So in the future, the easiest thing to change is to make would be the things that are contained in the policy and consistent with the ordinance. We can change the ordinance. It's just not a streamlined process as amending the policy itself. All right. Thanks for that question. Thank you. Member Bertrand. Thank you. I like the discussion about residential parking. This issue is brought up. A couple emails that I think we've all received. It's not personal conversations. The people who live in my house, as a matter of fact, about the ability to get parking spaces that they were promised at one time, and they are residents down there. So the competition, as we all know, is difficult for parking spots. And as Sam just brought up, maybe our programs in the lower parking lots could be advertised a little better or notices make it easier for them to know there's other options other than just right on the Esplanade parking areas. The issue of responding to a design and having a business jump into implementing that design and hiring people and stuff like that, that's a concern to me because this is not the normal thing that a business takes on. Some might be better than others, like Zelda does a lot of remodeling, for instance. Council Member Bertrand, if I may, I just want to – we're still on questions, and I just want to make sure you get your question. I am on question, and I'm just trying to lead up to it. Thank you, Mayor. So my issue is that timeline. So can city provide some options for them in terms of maybe contractors that we know or some development along that line? And a little bit longer than a month, it might take them longer to figure out who would do the implementation of a design that they like. That's my first question. And my second question is, these design guidelines, are they meant to be built exactly as designed, or are they sort of like guidelines that sort of provide an envelope for how something would be built within the guidelines? That's my second question. Sure. So your first question was who would do implementation of what a restaurant would like. And within the ordinance, we have it set up two ways. You can get an administrative permit for the prototype design, or you could create a custom design that goes to planning commission for approval. Within the prototype design, I think this will answer your second question, that design will have an overall look and feel that's standard, but there may be differences in shade structure, the design of planter boxes. We had a good example that I actually – I don't think I have a slide on it. Up in Los Gatos, they did three prototype designs that were very closely related, but the lighting system was a little bit different, the decking was a little bit different, and the shade structures were different. So we can add some variety there, but really we're trying to create a – have a design that people know what to expect, so not too much added variety into the prototype design so that we're not surprised at what gets built. Okay. I appreciate the idea of uniformity and the concept that you see when you come to Capitola, but I'd also like to see something that gives the ability of a business to give some originality, something that is unique to the Shepherd business. So is that possible, and how do we decide if some of those suggestions that a certain business might want to follow would be acceptable? Yeah, when we get – when we start working through the prototype design, we can keep that in mind and make sure that that's a possibility. But also they'll have some flexibility. They'll each be allowed two signs. They'll have the ability to have different furniture. They want to have umbrellas. You can really, between like – and their own specific planting type, they can make their space unique to all those accents that come into play with an outdoor dining area. Another question, a little bit of preparation for my question there. So one of the things I'm familiar with is that some of the businesses don't take up 
a lot of the parklets that they have right now, they may not have a lot of customers, uh, maybe they're not open as many hours as we would wish. Um, just to put this out there, do you think there's a possibility we could consider a shared parklet so that two businesses are uh, next to each other, they can share the resources, recognizing what I just brought up? And maybe you don't have an answer for this, but this might be a possibility for some restaurants. Um, that is a, a new suggestion. There's, you know, there's areas on uh, San Jose in which they share a ramp to a designated area, but really will be, it, the, they'll have to go through the lottery system, and if there were two restaurants that would want to partner, we really need to look at the specifics of that and make sure there's no issues with the, you know, the Department of Alcohol and Beverage Control at the UBC and um, we, we would just really have to look at it and make sure there's no issues tied to that concept, but it's a, a good idea. And we can look, if, if someone were proposing that, we'd definitely take a look. Try yeah. To yeah, I just wanted to put it out there. It might make a possibility for a business that it's here for wouldn't be able to do it for whatever reason. That's all. Thank you. Okay, um, Kay, I have just a few questions. Um, when you surveyed the businesses, were they aware that the question was revolving around the permanent, um, the permanent option and that they would be actually have to pay for, for it? Yeah, so in the survey, we outlined the parameters of the program that's being looked at. So we, we made it very clear that looking at an ordinance and the program explained what the cost would be per space. Um, and just, I, I think, um, and they were appreciative of that as well. I think they've all been keeping track of what's been going on at planning commission and city council. So um, we did, we outlined exactly what was going to be required in this new ordinance, and those responses reflect that information. And was there any discussion during planning commission, and I'm, I'm thinking more specifically around the Esplanade, um, if a business, sees, let's say, that in between two of the other businesses just chooses not to participate, how does that functionally work with parking? Um, you know, how, what, do, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so in the ordinance right now, it's drafted that, that you'd have, you'd be limited to those spaces that are directly in front of your, your restaurant. Um, there is some flexibility in the ordinance for uh, staff to look at unique situations and have some flexibility. We have a little bit of flexibility built into the ordinance for that, um, but uh, overall, um, it, I think that's where it's going to, you know, there may be gaps between parking areas, um, but we'll have to figure that out as soon as Okay, and was there any discussion at planning commission or concerns about that on the Esplanade or anywhere else that there would be Zelda two spots, pizza place, two spots, you know, that weren't being utilized? Was there any discussion about that? You know, um, during the hearing, there was not discussion on that, but I, I will tell you during um, the temporary outdoor dining program, I've heard from a lot of the restaurants that, um, that when the first time we removed some spots, they, the restaurants actually really like that. It gives, um, there's more opportunity for people to pull up, pick up food to go, and, and then leave. So there was, um, and, and also in filling out the survey, uh, the sandbar who changed their input, they, they provided some feedback to me on that as well, is that they were kind of in flux or undecided at first because they also think there's a great value to their customers to be able to drive up in front. So I think it, I think the system can work. I've seen it in a lot of uh, different jurisdictions where you can pull up in between um, parallel parks in between. Um, and I think it's uh, Pacific Grove has angled parking and they have just random decks along the street. They're not all connected, but it's really easy to park next to them as well. Um, we would have to think about uh, one one item that was brought up, actually, at planning commission is that like opening your door and designing to make sure that you can open the door if you park in the space directly next to angle parking. So that will have to come into play within the design. Okay, and so just 
for for clarity if those types of conversations occur during the prototype process creating that prototype process um and then should something occur that it doesn't sound like that is going to work we need to amend our ordinance which then has to go back to coastal commission is that how that process would work well right now there's nothing in the ordinance that would prevent us from making sure that the prototype design is one foot off of a you know located a foot back from the uh, parking space next to it so there's nothing like okay. in the ordinance that we need to be amended under that scenario and there's also nothing in the prototype design that would limit whether or not we have a 90 degree angle or an angled parking spot so okay and then lastly you know we're, we're serving current restaurants and with just how businesses are and we see that businesses open and close and shutter do we have anything written in our ordinance about change of ownership and um you know should they not want to participate or if they have some sort of outdoor dining that they want to dissolve do we have anything around that so uh, situation so that will be in the administrative uh policy of how we deal with the leases and um how it would continue you know the, op the option would continue to the next owner but if they wanted to uh, no longer participate that would be in the lease those are all of my questions for now. Um, all right, let's let's move this to um, our attendees. I have one question. Oh, council member for chance, excuse me. Yeah, um, I forgot who brought up the issues with um, interference with parklets, but when, you know, I did a couple of inspections and I know that there was one parklet where obviously a car had hit the edge. And um, so there could be that issue too. Um, I didn't think about the opening of car doors if it was a, you know, ice, um, you know, a surrounded parking space, but that's another issue. I don't know about reflective case and all that sort of stuff. So we'll build in safety features to the prototype design and we'll also review to make sure that parklets are safe within a custom design. Okay, so let's go ahead and move this to public comment. If you'd like to make a uh, comment now, you can um, raise your hand by clicking on reactions below, or if you've phoned in, you can dial star nine or star six, depending on if you have a cell phone or a landline, or you can email us directly. Mayor Brooks, we have a couple attendees wishing to speak. Um, the first one is, pardon me if I mispronounce your, your last name, Randy Zoncha. Okay, you have three minutes to speak. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay. Hi, I'm a long time visitor to Capitola over several decades, and I really liked Capitola for the beach. And I understand the COVID thing going on, but what you've done, what you're proposing is to dramatically reduce the square footage allowed to the public in the village, which is really an anti-COVID measure because you're squeezing everybody together. Um, but what I really don't understand about this is that I like the way Capitola was before, and you're trying to make these changes permanent. Uh, you don't know if COVID's going to be permanent. And I occasionally rent from Beach House Rentals, and we like, like it to be quiet at night. And if there's people sitting on the sidewalk down, dining into all hours, uh, that's going to increase the noise also. So those are the downsides. I'd like to keep Capitola the way it was. I'd like to make plans just to be a temporary thing and make plans to return to what worked before. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We have Linda Smith. Okay, thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to speak once again. I did send um, quite a narrative that I had planned to speak on the 23rd, and I trust that you have had a chance to read it, so I'm not going to read it to you tonight. I am including some of the points, um, and something that I noted from Katie's presentation, uh, November 23rd, is that what we're calling permanent is really a three-year trial. 
It's not permanent. It has an exit strategy. And what we have now is really working. It includes both sidewalk and street dining areas that are bringing vitality to the city and a chance to recover for our businesses. And people are going to continue to prefer to dine outdoors when possible, especially in the good times. I frequent the village, and I eat at the restaurants with my husband two to four times a week. I'm down there a lot. And the survey is a good survey, but it would not have captured most of my visits to the village. And I think between 1130 and 2 every day, especially on Monterey Avenue, you've got a lot of people that are down there eating out. So I just want you to know that I think those numbers are probably on the low side. The other thing that I've recently noted is bicycle parking. We have some centralized bicycle parking areas, and they're rarely full. So scattering them out through the village area would probably really add some clutter. So the in-lieu parking fee that has been suggested in the ordinance is a really great idea. It might want to just replace that requirement. The ordinance should refine the existing program and provide an exit strategy, which I think it does. Draft ordinance number 2, I would really like to see you guys go forward with that. Worst case, extend the temporary all the way to the end when the given through the next season. But if you move forward, it looks like the timeline might allow them to actually react and have a higher quality parklet structure down there in time for the next season. So I guess I'm asking for you guys to really move forward and direct the planning commission to go work on the prototype. And thank you for considering my comments. Thank you. Larry, anyone else? Mayor Brooks, I do not see any other attendees with their hands raised to speak on this item. And we do not have any emails on this item. Okay. So we'll bring this back to council for further deliberation and comments. Who would like to begin? Council Member Peterson. Thank you. So I first want to say thank you to the planning commission and for everyone who has emailed us and provided public comment tonight. Lots of time and effort have gone into the consideration, as well as staff. Thank you so much, Katie, and everyone else who's worked on this. A lot of time and effort has gone into consideration of this permanent program, or as mentioned in public comment, a program that would have a one to five year trial period. From what I've heard so far, I'm prepared to support Ordinance 2. I don't think it's appropriate for city council to, or for the city in general, to suggest a contractor for the prototype for the businesses to use. And just to clarify, now is not the time to make comments related to the temporary program, correct? This is just for the permanent one? Okay. Just for the permanent one, I'm prepared to move forward in supporting Ordinance 2. Katie, would you mind clicking through to the next slide just to make sure that I'm seeing everything that Ordinance 2 includes? I think there was like a couple after this that have this thing, three. I mean, what you were showing, but there was like three slides of what you were showing, right? Sorry, I didn't mean to make things more complicated than they already are with this item. Well, for the sake of discussion, while we're getting the slides pulled up, I guess I'll just start by saying I'm willing to make a motion to support Ordinance 2. And I'll leave it for now. For now. All right. Council Member Bertrand. Council Member, you are muted. I'm 
sorry about that. Um, yeah, I'm willing to support this motion. And I do have a question on Kristen. So um, to get to the permit, are you willing to accept a temporary until we get the uh, prototypes? Well, we're not there yet. So um, I have comments on the temporary program, um, but that's why I asked if I should discuss the temporary program for now. But I think if we're only discussing the ordinance related to the outdoor program, or excuse me, the permanent program, um, then then for now my only comments are that I support ordinance number two um, and that the permanent program technically be a three-year trial. Okay, uh, thanks Katie for putting up the slide. Yeah, especially, um, I worry initially, um, even though I talk to people in the city, um, I can make comments now, I believe, right, Mayor? So um, I was worried that they were going to uh, cut out Capitol Avenue, so I see that in there. Um, I too would like to thank city planning. Um, I think it's notable that they've gone down and talked to uh, all the businesses and done multiple surveys. I've talked to business owners who were quite happy that Canadian staff came down there and got their comments. I, I think that's exemplary. I, I think it's um, very much indicative that we have a dedicated staff, and um, thank you very much. Um, when this first came up, um, originally, uh, I guess there was a lot of naysayers, but you know, we've talked about it so much, and city staff has been so involved in talking with um, residents and businesses that these comments have sort of been mollified and people are beginning to understand, you know, after they've seen it, um, how successful it's been. And uh, to um, paraphrase what Linda Smith said, what we have is working. And what better confirmation do you have when you see people enjoying themselves, uh, coming to the visit uh, Capitola and, you know, just making this a place that is very inviting. And um, I do understand that it's not quite like what Capitola was, um, but it's a new Capitola. It's, it's a Capitola that many people are now enjoying, and you know businesses are finding it a little bit easier to stay open, which is really, I think, a great benefit. Um, so I'm glad to support this motion. Thank you. My fair story. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Burke. Um, and sticking to the motion, um, uh, as I understand it, in order to um, allow um, sidewalk dining on Capitol Avenue, we would have to um, include that in the ordinance. Uh, since we have a current business that has um, a sidewalk dining um, sort of table, um, I just want to confirm whether or not that is the case, and whether uh, Councilwoman Peterson would be willing to add that to her motion um, if, if, it, if it's necessary. Can you, can you clarify, uh, Vice Mayor Story? I'm looking at Ordinance 2, and it says that Capitola Avenue is already included. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I'm looking at street side dining for sidewalk dining. Yes, yes, I'd be willing to include that. Right. Um, um, well, well, thank you for uh, that amendment, and hopefully the seconder will accept that. Um, I think so. And, if, and so, um, yeah, I would certainly support that option. Mayor, may I uh, make some general comments now um, about that? Thank you uh, so much. And, um, and, and I also want to start by saying um, how much I appreciate the work that the Planning Commission has done, the staff has done on this, um, you know, in a very uh, complicated and uh, significant transition uh, to our village businesses. Um, but um, I want to tell the planning commission that I um, respect their work um, and, um, and for the most part, you know, I think our motion uh, is in alignment with their recommendation, um, except for the um, and issues about which streets are eliminating certain streets uh, and eliminating sidewalk dining. And in those in general, I just think, um, I don't know that we should categorically eliminate uh, the Esplanade and, and I'll start that, I mean, Monterey and Texola Avenue, uh, some of our um, I think best parklets 
um, activities that have been on those streets, um, and as well, um, you know, with the sidewalk dining, uh, they have, you know, worked and functioned well. Uh, obviously, we need to, as a city, need to make sure that they're, they are accessible, that they continue to be ADA accessible. Um, um, but, you know, El Sol Bravo, I think, has done a very good job uh, in their sidewalk uh, programs. And, you know, they are uh, limited in being able to move out into the street. Um, and, uh, and looking at El Sol Bravo specifically, I think that um, if, um, uh, in order to improve that design, it, you know, the, the, the trash can that's in front of their business and the bench that is in front of their business uh, could be moved. That would uh, accommodate more space, both uh, for them and for uh, the pedestrians. Um, and also, you know, I, the use of the barrel um, in front of El Foro Bravo, I think, also unnecessarily takes up sidewalk, sidewalk space uh, there. But uh, overall, um, I support, um, um, you know, Capitola moving outside. And I think in general, we need to do that from a public health standpoint. Um, um, and I think that, you know, obviously the city has a uh, financial interest in being sure that the businesses in the village are um, um, maintain their viability and thrive. Um, I think the um, consumers um, moving forward, uh, and especially that we're still in the midst of uh, the pandemic, uh, but I think even afterwards, um, the consuming public is going to want to have more um, outdoor uh, dining options, and in order to continue to attract visitors to Capitola, we need to provide those um, options in order to stay viable. Um, and um, there's also the interest here, uh, because I think for, you know, over the 40 years that I've been a resident here, we have attempted and strived to have people move their parking into our parking lot. Um, and I think this is now a, a meaningful way to be able to attempt to do that. Um, and, and as a part of that, I would like to see us look at um, providing incentives for the residents and employees to uh, be able to have permits to park behind City Hall um, and um, at a much reduced cost since their parking options are now going to be um, less than what they once were um, and uh, my, uh, well, I guess my other comments are about the timing and the temporary program, and I believe that's going to be a separate uh, uh, discussion and motion, so I'll reserve it until then. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Sturry. Thanks for playing by the rules, everyone. I know it's hard not to intermingle the, the two items. You know, my, my comments in regards to outdoor dining is, it, it, I, I support this because in order for us to really see the vision come through, really to see it transpire to something beautiful and sustainable and great for our community, we have to move forward with this ordinance. Um, I've been really disappointed in, in the way it's been looking out on the Esplanade and um, I really hope that with all of these these, uh, with this ordinance in place and with the, the prototypes and with the support of the city that we can really make it look beautiful. And if it doesn't, we, like we, we've all talked about, that there's an out, there's a way that we could say, well, then you, you, you can't do this. And that's what makes me feel good about supporting this today. So I appreciate everyone's time and effort on this um, and really look forward to seeing what will become of it. Um, so with that, uh, Council Member Peterson, for formality's sake, we're looking at, I'm looking at the language on item, on the item 8B, and I think that is our formal, uh, the format, formal way of, of introducing or to approving this. And I'm going to ask Samantha, our city attorney, to review that language um, with me. Um, and it was clear to me that we would just approve ordinance 2 as presented by staff, and that was the motion on the table with the amendment. 
members from council member or excuse me vice mayor story but if you need more from us please let me know katie did you want to say something i just want to let you know i have um the the one modification that i believe was requested and i'd like to pull that up on the screen to make sure i got that correct okay we don't want to bear with me and my mouth (laughs) please slow so what i heard from the from the amendment was to add capitola avenue to the locations where sidewalk dining could occur within the mixed use village and that was to ensure race deli would be included as mentioned in your staff report earlier is that does that cover it is that what you need that would cover it yeah okay um so i believe that is what the motion is on the table to accept ordinance to us presented by staff with that amendment to the sidewalk dining section c 1 b to include capital at app samantha do you need me to read the item 8b or is that okay for us to present it i'll just confirm it to make sure that we have the text regarding waiver for the waiting for the reading in the in the record so i think that council member peterson's motion was to introduce by title only waiting for the reading of the text an ordinance of the city council for healing and replacing municipal code section 17.96.170 and amending municipal code section 17.120.030 related to outdoor dining in the public right-of-way with the amendments just articulated by director Hurley. did i get that right councilmember peterson you took the word right out of my mouth yeah that's, that's exactly what i was trying to say excellent thanks okay so we have a first and a second on the table so we can have a roll call please council member bertrand i agree council member peterson aye vice mayor story aye mayor brooks aye Okay, now we're going to move on to the second portion of this item this evening regarding the temporary outdoor dining that is currently scheduled to end on January 3rd. Um, Katie, I'll turn this back over to you um, if you have some slides to share with us. No, I don't have any additional slides. So tonight we're just looking for direction on um, the the current um, emergency order is due to expire on January 3rd, 2022 and we're looking for direction on whether or not to extend can you pull that slide up again in your presentation you did have a timeline that played that one through for us and while she's doing that samantha do i need to go up to um questions to the public and back again or does this just continue no, it was at the mayor's discretion, but the items, you have already gotten out public comment on the yeah. items, so you certainly you do not need to do it again on this section of the items that we're doing this one item. Okay. Um, council members, I will go back to public for this item just in case someone forgot to mention anything, but um, while Katie's looking at that, Actually, I'm going to wait for that to come up before I go to public comment. So this slide shows how the ordinance will play out with um, the city council's timing. That most likely will have coastal commission certification in March, a blanket coastal development permit in April, and hopefully uh, at that point we can move forward with permits. So. Um, so just for clarification since we've waived the second or excuse me yes we we're going to have the second reading on december 9th yes yeah. and then it'll go to postal commission for march 2022 and then hopefully all good by april um any questions from council about this council member peterson Thank you, Mayor. I just want to confirm. I, I always want to make sure that I'm understanding correctly before I make any motion or decision. So if we were to theoretically uh, extend the temporary program through April, then that would mean that at the end of April or at some point in April, um, those who are temporary would have to pull down their their temporary outdoor dining. Those who had gotten permits 
uh, would be able to begin construction on their on their permanent three-year outdoor dining program. So there essentially would be that month of April in which the temporary stuff goes away, the permanent stuff could begin building, correct? Theoretically. Theoretically, we should have um, a blanket CBT approved by the Planning Commission in April and be able to open up our lottery. Great, thank and you. The temporary would have to go away in order to build the new permit. Okay, great, thank you. Councilmember Bertrand. You're muted. Council member, you're muted. I pushed the space bar, I thought that works. Okay. So um, once it goes into lottery, um, so this starts a clock. So how long will that extend and is this enough time? That, that's, I just want to make sure the businesses have enough time. And that's why I mentioned a couple of things earlier in terms of trying to help them out, trying to get qualified contractors. This is not their normal thing. I'm interested in how much time this would give the businesses that win the lottery, et cetera, to um, get everything together. If, if we have this, the um, coastal development in hand in April, that will, the, the permit through the city are free. Um, so we won't be holding them up at that point. They just need to apply and show us where it will be. And uh, the review process there will be very quick turnaround um, if, it's, if it's a prototype design because the building department will have already looked at this. Right. So the turnaround there is, is fast. I would expect um, probably construction in like the later half of May or early June based on this timeline. The only thing that would slow this down is if the coastal commercial certification if they ask for an extension beyond the 60 working days that they're allowed to review the ordinance before it goes to hearing. So they, they do have the ability to ask for more time and it could be up to another up to a year. But where they've reviewed the ordinance uh, prior to the planning commission, I don't foresee that happening to Capitola, but it's just it maybe that that is the one hiccup that could occur between now and then. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to extend too long because it extends into our busy period for the businesses. You know, they would like to get this done sooner than later for the summer grant. Thanks, Mayor Story. Yeah, thank you once again, Mayor. Um, Katie, just, um, I want to try to better understand the transition from the temporary to the uh, prototype design. Um, and um, once the prototypes are approved um, and the lottery is held, or we determine how many restaurants um, uh, want one, um, how long will they have to build the prototype and abandon the temporary? So abandoning the temporary will be dependent on your decision tonight. So if the city council only if the city council extends um, the temporary program through say, the, the last day in March, then on April 1st, all of the temporary outdoor dining have to be have to be out of the street on that last day. Um, and according to this timing, most likely our blanket coastal development permit would go to planning commission in April. Our first meeting is, is the um, the first Thursday of April is when that would go to planning commission. And then there's a, an appeal period for a, a CDT, so we'd have to, um, there'd be an appeal period for the coastal permit. So it would likely take effect in May of 2022. So I think uh, the planning commission, the city council extending it either through March or late April uh, would be a fair extension that wouldn't get in the way of the new the new deck being built. So, would, is it preferable um, from a staff standpoint for us to set a hard date 
from when the temporary must be um, um, terminated um, and then come back and revisit that if we get delayed? Um, or could we um, extend the temporary until the um, prototypes are approved um, and then give businesses those uh, 30 days after they've been um, allotted the slot to um, build their uh, permanent um, prototype design. Do you, do you think what I'm trying to get to? Or? Yeah, I, I, I think it would be easier to extend it to a date certain and not tie it to the future permit just in case something were to happen with the permitting process and the prototype. Um, but it, it's very easy, as you know, we've continued the, we've extended the order several times. It's very easy for us to extend it. So um, I, I, I think that would be staff's preference. And I see that Director Jesper has his hand raised and he may have some input on this matter. Yeah, so I just wanted to point out that the policy that's included in the packet, the administrative policy and how we're going to administrate this. <clears throat> Once we have the ordinances in place and the prototype approved, if we have to do a lottery, we have a 45-day period where we'll accept applications to the lottery. That can be amended later on to approve that policy, but that's what's in there now. And as far as construction, they are given six months from the time they're issued a permit to finish construction of their deck. Um, again, that's amendable, but that's what's in the policy at this time. So I just want to make those points. Thank you. Right. Thank you for that clarification, Steve. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Let's go ahead and go to public comment so then in regards to the extension of our temporary outdoor dining ordinance. For those watching, this is, we've moved on to that item. Mayor Brooks, we do have, we have some one attendee wishing to speak on this item, and I think we have at least one email as well. Okay. Here's Linda Smith. So thank you once again, Mayor Brooks, for the opportunity to speak. And I first want to tell you that um, I really appreciate the amount of deliberation and very thoughtful questions and things that you as council members um, have brought up this evening. And I, I really, really, my hat's off to all of you. Thank you very much for your consideration. Um, Memorial Day is in May, at the end of May, and that's a pretty active time down in the village. And what I think I'm hearing is that there's going to be a period of time where there will be no temporary dining available during the construction of the guys that win the lottery. So um, with the April date of having a prototype, uh, my, my thought is just that I have had recent trouble getting con you know, contractors to, to work because of the amount of business um, due to CBU fire activity and they're all just super, super busy. So until the restaurant owners know that they have spaces, that they've won the lottery, if you will, it's going to be very hard for them to contact and line up um, somebody to build the right size parklet for them. So I would ask that maybe you lean towards um, letting the temporary extend a little bit farther into when you think you might have something so that they're not down during those active weekends, um, you know, when we get a lot of people in the village over Memorial Day, for example, in May. Um, and when I look at the timeline that you're discussing, that's what comes to my mind. So thank you very much. Thank you. Larry? Yes, Mayor Brooks, we have an email. I'm going to share my screen and try to read aloud things. That's okay. Okay. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council members. Having previously weighed in on this temporary outdoor dining program, I do not intend to repeat myself other than to point out 
This program was introduced to the Capitola community as a temporary measure in support of our business community. Residents and our visitors have given over valuable parking to business in the Capitola village as a temporary measure in support of business. It is now time for business to return the favor and reopen this valuable parking to the residents and visitors of our beach community. I therefore urge the Capitola City Council to terminate this temporary emergency measure in favor of all members of our community, not just for the use of private business. With all due respect, signed, our Eric Bossett, 40 year Capitola resident and homeowner. We do not have any other attendees wishing to speak on this item, and I, we do not have any emails. Thank you, Larry. Turn this back to Council for further discussion. Any motion? Council Member Peterson? Thank you. First, I, I just want to clarify, unless I'm mistaken, staff can let me know if I am, of course. Um, but I believe that um, the city council approved a uh, parklet program, a temporary, or not a temporary, a, a pilot parklet program back in 2015 or 2016. And it just turned out that, that no one ended up moving forward with it. So while this COVID related uh, outdoor dining program is meant to be temporary, in general, the city have plans to put some kind of outdoor dining parklet program together several years ago, I think, like right, right before I got elected in 2016. So this isn't unheard of for our city. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that uh, based on, on what we heard from some of the public comments. Um, initially, my thought was to extend our temporary uh, program to April with the idea that if we were gonna be getting our um, uh, permanent program ready by then, then that would be kind of a, a good time for us to get rid of the temporary outdoor dining and um, give a couple months of kind of, I, I almost want to call it breathing room um, for the businesses to start developing their, their permanent purpose. Um, I'm interested in hearing from other council members on their thoughts about whether it should extend to April or further out based on the fact that, uh, you know, we'll have that 45 day lottery and then uh, six months from permit to construction. I think that six months isn't really our responsibility. If they, if the businesses have six months to build, if they finish it in 30 days, fantastic. If it takes them six months, we shouldn't need to extend a, a temporary program for them while they're doing that six months of construction. So that's my thought on that. Um, but I am interested in hearing what the rest of the council thinks about potentially extending the temporary program and how long they'd like to. I was originally thinking April, um, but I'm, I'm curious as to others' thoughts on if it should go longer. Thank you. Councilmember Bertrand. Um, I wasn't prepared for um, uh, uh, Kristen's uh, questions, but um, I, I did have a question. Um, so I know there was a design, as Kristen talked about, um, we approved an earlier effort, and there was a design brought forward. Can, can that design be brought forth out and it's a potential design. Um, I think it was submitted uh, for the uh, Cruzio uh, uh, wine bar area. So that's my question of Katie. I, I don't know if that design is still available. And then I'll make some comments to Kristen's questions. So, sorry. Echoing. There you go. Okay. Um, currently, we have $10,000 to go out for a prototype design that would uh, be, you know, that's been a lot of through the city council. There was a previous application on, Capit on uh, San Jose Avenue, as you mentioned, the Capitola Line Bar, and then they pulled back their application. There was a recent public comment um, from the wine bar suggesting that pos there's a possibility of utilizing that design and that's something we could look into further. I don't know if it would cost money um, or, you know, we could look into it, but really we do have the $10,000 to move forward with prototype design and we have, at this point, uh, 
we reached out to, to uh, a couple of different designers, landscape architects, and we have one proposal that we're um, thinking of moving ahead with. So um, that's, that's where we stand today, but I, I could do some more. Uh, I could ask. Yeah, I, I appreciate you asking because the design's already been done and it didn't cost the city anything and it might be a great way to um, start this program. So um, I am concerned that businesses won't be able to respond very fast and as the public comment alluded to, it's difficult to get contractors right now. So um, I never did, maybe I just wasn't phrasing it correctly, try to suggest that the city um, identify uh, preferred contractors, but I'm thinking that it might help the, the, res uh, the businesses if they had some options to, to choose from, you know, some suggested options. Um, because <laughs> I've had two businesses before in San Francisco, and believe me, if I got thrown the opportunity to design a parklet or whatever you want to call it, and I was just busily running my business all day long, which was the case, I don't think I have much energy and so any kind of help. And I think the comment that um, Memorial Day is the kickoff uh, for a lot of uh, businesses down in the Esplanade, you know, sort of points to the fact that it's going to be a very short timeline. And I think Krista did mention that if they have to take down everything before they start building because they're not ready to launch, uh, that's a consideration I'd like to see uh, other members of the city council speak to as well. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor Story. Um, thanks again, Mayor Brett. And, um, you know, I guess I want to um, first start off by saying that, um, you know, what we're doing for um, this trial period with the prototype but um, it's not just for the for benefit of the private businesses. Um, the city has a space, uh, both from a public health standpoint and then from a financial standpoint, to making sure that we continue to thrive as a tourist community. Um, that's the lifeblood of capital. It, it always has been. Um, and the uh, COVID was not, is not going to be um, a one-off event. Um, as we've seen, it, it has continued uh, to percolate and perpetuate. Um, and as we've seen again with a new variant uh, and being found in Capitola, uh, not Capitola, in California, um, I think it's incumbent upon us to uh, continue this outdoor dining program. And, uh, you know, the question is for, you know, what period or duration of time. Um, and frankly, you know, it, it seems to me that we should continue it um, uh, with all the information that is before us at this point until um, after Memorial Day, in other words, to June 1st. Um, and I think that, um, I mean, ideally at that point, we'll have the prototypes. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have the water we, we know um, which restaurants are going to participate. And I think that they should be given after that uh, 30 days uh, to um, um, complete their prototype construction. Um, uh, and if they haven't, they can take the six months if they like, but then the temporary parklets would go away after 30 days. Um, and they'd be given that a lot of time uh, to do the construction. Um, and so in terms of timing, um, I guess that, that's my thought about it, um, is, is to just, I think realistically continue the parklet, the temporary parklet until, um, um, May 31st, and then um, assuming that everything else is in place, that um, they only, you know, they'd be given an additional 30 days, and if the prototype's not up, then the temporary goes away. So that, that's my thought, and I'll, I'll make that as a motion. Okay, we have a first to it. 
on the table from Vice Mayor Story to extend the temporary outdoor ordinance to May 31st. And before, I just want to make a quick comment to just address what the question was from Councilmember Peterson. And, you know, honestly, all of these dates are so hypothetical at this point. You know, a lot can happen. We're riding on, we're waiting, we're going to have to wait for a coastal commission, we're going to have to wait for a lot of stuff. And so I don't see that we need to really get too worried about the state. We know how easy it is to come back. We know how, you know, we can continue these conversations about it and align the right timeline for when we get there. So I don't have a problem with May 31st at all. I just want us to, I just want to acknowledge the fact that the dates presented today by staff were really just open-ended. And I see Katie nodding her head. And, you know, these were all kind of guesses on how this would transpire. So those are just my thoughts. Councilmember Peterson. Great, thank you. Yeah, I agree. I am willing to second Vice Mayor Story's motion, but I also have a quick question I'm hoping Katie can clarify. So if we're going to extend the temporary program to May 31st, and we are expecting people to build within the first 30 days, but we hope, you know, they can take the six months if they want, do they start paying the cost for their parklet when they're in construction, since they're already taking up those parking spaces? Or do they not start paying their, essentially their rent on those spaces until the parklet's open? I'm not 100% sure if we have that outlined in the administrative policy at this point. Including the lease? And the lease, they would begin to need to begin paying when they take possession of the property, which would include construction. Okay, good. That's what I was hoping. Because I'm willing to second the motion to extend out to May 31st, but I think if someone's going to take six months to build a parklet, then they should be paying for the lost revenue in that six months that we don't have those parking spaces. Yeah, okay. So I will second the motion. Council Member Bertrand. Thank you, Mayor, for pointing out probably what was the obvious, that these dates are quite changeable. I also have another question for Katie in that vein. Is there a chance that this whole process could be foreshortened? So the design comes up ahead of time, or Coastal Commission is really fast because they love you so much. Who knows? So we could go a little bit faster. Is that a possibility? There's always that possibility. I think right now, with the rate of development applications we've been seeing locally here in Capitola, I think, and I've heard from the other directors in the region, everyone's extremely busy right now with lots of planning applications. So I can't imagine that the Coastal Commission will expedite this through the process. And there's a lot of new ordinances regarding housing that will be going through the Coastal Commission as well because of new legislation. So there's always that chance, but I don't think it's highly likely. It would be great, though. Thank you. Okay, so we have a first and a second to extend the outdoor dining to, excuse me, to extend the temporary outdoor dining program currently scheduled to end on January 3rd, 2022 to May 31st, 2022. May I have a roll call, please? Councilmember Bertrand. I approve. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Story. Aye. Mayor Brooks. Aye. This item passes. Moving forward. Thank you, Katie. Unless you're staying on for the next item. No, okay. We get a nice break. All right, we're going to turn this over to Larry. We're on item B, Mandatory Organic Waste Disposal Reduction Ordinance. 
Okay, more fun. Let me uh, share my screen. And just for the record, we are welcoming back Council Member Kaiser. Nice to see you. Oh, don't want to share sound. I had one earlier. Okay. Can you see my screen okay? Great. Um, before you today is a, a, an ordinance to um, basically address some changes in the state law. Um, in 2016, um, the state of California passed SB 1383. We have discussed this a couple times with our um, waste disposal agreement last year as well as our updated franchise agreement that the 13.3 is driving a lot of changes in the industry. Um, one of the big pieces of it is establishes methane reduction targets for jurisdictions as well as the state. And part of the requirement is local jurisdictions are required to adopt a mandatory organic reduction ordinance by January 1st, 2022. So enacting uh, Chapter 804 of the, the Municipal Code Solid Waste the Edible Food Recovery um, will allow the city to meet this requirement. The ordinance will require that source separation and collection of food uh, waste and scraps takes place. We will need to develop a program for monitoring, monitoring compliance. We will do this in conjunction with green waste as well as the, uh, the uh, monitoring regional waste management district. The development of a food, edible food recovery program. This is going to be a countywide program. Um, you know, we, there's a lot of great partners in this for the county. Um, Second Harvest Food Bank, great, great there. They're doing quite a bit, and we're going to uh, leverage that to make sure that we include every, every place that's required. In addition, we're going to need to conduct outreach and education. We're going to be working with Green Waste Recovery on this. In fact, they should be getting out communications to all customers um, either be, by the end of this week or very beginning of next week. Um, and another part of this is we need to procure and track purchases of recycled paper, which we already do. We have an environmental purchasing policy, but we also need to add some things about purchasing re recycled organic waste products. Um, we are going to be bringing an updated policy to council um, probably in January at some point to address the changes for this, but this is not part of the ordinance. Kind of overall how this program on a big picture is going to work. The food scraps will be included in everyone's green carts. Um, you know, right now the green carts are designed for um, kind of yard trimmings, um, the processing at Monterey Regional um, will include um, certain types of food scraps, and I'll go into that. Um, this is going to be collected by Green Waste as part of the regular collection process. Um, it's included in new franchise agreements, and included in that franchise agreement are the costs associated with that, and they were approved as part of the approved collection rates. Kind of an overall what is going to be accepted at this point, and make sure we understand that this is a very uh, this is going to be changing over time. This is what currently can be accepted. You know, we all hope that, you know, other things will be added as we go along, but this is what's going to start. Um, what they call un all unpackaged food scraps. Food scraps is a term the, the state uses quite a bit. And this will be fruits and vegetables, the cooked meats, um, cheese and dairy is a good important thing, not, not liquid. This is, you know, maybe cottage cheese and things like that, but no milk or those sort of products. And all prepared food. Flowers and plants can go in, as well as coffee grounds. The, the one type of paper they are that they, they can process are coffee filters and tea bags. The list of not accepted right now is pretty large, but you know we want to make sure that you know as part of this, as we talked about monitoring, they're going to be have to be very strict on what what can go here. And as they find things that don't belong, they're they're going to have to go back and make sure uh, customers understand why. Um, other than the coffee filters and tea bags, no food packaging. Um, the process system cannot handle that at this point. Um, compostable plastics, I use the term in quotes, we, as over the years we've found out that term um, isn't a hard target. People have changed what that means, but for right now they cannot go in um, the green bin. They're going to continue going in the trash, um, the, you know, the, the green bin. Just plastic bags, liquids as we talked about, no raw meats. Um, other paper products cannot go in. 
catch waste and kitty litter cannot go in, and of course, recycling and trash cannot be included. So in front of you right now, the recommended action is to introduce the first read by title only, um, and waiving the reading of the text, an ordinance repealing the current Capitola Municipal Code Chapter 804, 8.04, which is garbage, and enacting Chapter 8.04, solid waste and edible food recovery. And I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Larry. Council members, any questions? Councilmember Bush Um, Yeah, question, Larry. Does this mean that processing is going to be different now for green waste? Um, I've done various tours to I've been on certain um, um, educational things in terms of recycling. And so is this going to be processed any differently, especially since you have meat in there and such? Yeah, I mean, they, they, their processing is going to handle all that. So yes, I mean, you know, I, I can't give you the exact how it's being processed, but it is being collected and it'll be processed at Monterey Regional. Um, and so whatever they're using to include this, um, yes, it'll, it'll end up being processed differently down there. But, it, but from, the, from the end user, it's going, it's going to be included with the yard trimmings. Okay. Um, so another question, I, I read the ordinance carefully and it seems like whole com home composting, home composting is, is is allowed, there's no issues with that. Right, so I know there's several people that do that. And another question was, um, there was something about burying stuff in odd places, so there was a whole list of that. Uh, what is that all about? Um, you know, that, that the, the model ordinance from the state included a lot of things we don't see, um, but it was one of the things that um, uh, our city attorney uh, firm, uh, people that helped us with this, included keeping that because we don't want people digging a hole in their yard and laying a compost in, in, a, in a, a, a not correct manner. Um, but that goes with any of the, the, the yard, the, the trash waste. You know, we don't want people burying their own trash in their yard. Well, anaerobic recycling is one way to do it, but it's not trash, it's well, organic. Yeah, organics and an anaerobic and organics are a problem. That's when the methane comes in. So I can stop doing that? Sorry, I'm just saying. I couldn't help myself. It's really bad if you live in an apartment. That's when they really get mad. <laughs> oh my gosh, guys. <laughs> that is. Okay, any other questions? Straight to young. I want to know who's the Sailor Moon in logo. But anyway. Okay. <laughs> We're going to now move to public comment. Now is the time to uh, raise your hand down below under reaction, or if you've called in, you can dial star nine or star six, depending on you. if you're on a cell phone or phone, cell phone or landline, or you can email us directly at public comment. Hey, it looks like do not see any attendees with their hands raised on this item, and I do not have any emails on this item. Okay, so I'll bring this back to council for deliberation and a vote. Councilmember Bertrand. Well, I move that we approve the first reading of this ordinance. If that's the correct way, Mayor. Sure, so we have a motion to uh, approve the recommended action to which uh, uh, to introduce the first reading by title only, waiving further reading of the text and the ordinance for repealing Capital Municipal Code Chapter 8.04, garbage and enacting Chapter 8.04, solid waste and edible food recovery. So we have a first. I'll second. And we have a second for Vice Mayor Story. There's no other comments. Can I have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Bertrand. I approve. Councilmember Kaiser. Aye. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Story. Aye. Mayor Brooks. Aye. This item passed with unanimously. Now we move on to item C, the new state of California housing legislation and community development department housing work plan. And tonight we're just going to uh, 
listened to staff's presentation on the recent housing legislation and the community development department's work plan. Okay, thank you, Mayor Brooks and Council. Um, first, I'd like to take a minute to say thank you to Sam and her team. This presentation was actually put together by Lila, Layla on uh, Sam's team, and she's going to be presenting tomorrow night to our Planning Commission a more in-depth presentation on the legislative update. I wanted to bring this to you tonight so you understand uh, just what's been happening at the state level and why in the new year I'm coming forward with RFPs for um, a housing element update and several other new uh, summoning ordinances. So with that, I'll jump in and this can be a high level discussion. I don't know all of the new laws inside and out, so uh, I'll keep it high level and we'll be bringing you more updates as we proceed and get into the details of the work next year. So 31 new housing related bills passed through uh, legisl California legislation. Um, this evening I'm going to give you a quick overview of SB9, Ministerial, Ministerial Project Approval. Um, there have been two uh, changes within SB8 and SB10 towards streamlining of permit reviews and then some changes for the update to the housing element that will affect our timing of review for our sixth cycle, which is due in two years. So overarching trends of the legislature was there's um, the legislation was very friendly towards multifamily residential. Um, and this trend is expected to increase in the future. Affordability and increased inventory and also um, equity within the housing. So SB9, I'm sure you've all seen the headlines in the newspaper talking about SB9. This is a ministerial approval and it's applicable in our single family zoning district. Within SB9, a property owner may create two lots with up to two units on each lot. So our single family zoning as we know it probably needs a new name <laughs> under the change because every lot can be divided into two lots and have two units on each lot. Um, there are, our development standards will have to permit um, new units that have setbacks of up to four feet from the rear and side property lines, up to one parking space per unit, uh, zero in close proximity to transit, must require that rentals be longer than 30 days. So this, utilizing um, this new methodology, you can have a vacation home and we can set standards for a minimum, or a, uh, it has to allow up to a minimum of 800 square feet. So in the new year, how would we treat a new single family home in the R1 zone that requires a design permit for TC? Um, we can only apply the objective development standards, so we're looking at height, setback, floor area ratio, and parking. When the Planning Commission reviews a new home, this is not an addition, additions still have the same review they've had. A new home, most of our city's design permit criteria is discretionary and could not be reviewed, um, such as protecting privacy, compatibility with the neighborhood look and feel. Um, those standards could not be applied, so just the objective standards um, for next steps, we are prepared to move forward on an update to our zoning code and municipal code um, because of, um, to update not only the single family zoning district but also our subdivision regulations. Um, we'll outline the application review process and develop objective development standards, which at a minimum uh, could include a maximum square footage of 800 square feet, the four foot setback that we can get into specifics of materials um, and more. So that, that's what we've got coming to you in the new year. Um, SB8 is another bill that passed. It amends the Housing Crisis Act of SB 330, which is all about streamlining of affordable housing projects. So it was due to expire and now it's been extended to January 1st, 2030. Um, and I won't get into too much detail here, but in the future, um, there's no municipal code changes that need to take place, but we are going to increase our tracking of any affordable housing projects to make sure we're in compliance with the streamlining that is required under SB8. Um, and then AB 1398, this is an update to our requirements for the housing element. 
And as you all know, uh, the term the MENA number comes, comes up often. Currently, I think we have, we're required to build 100 and, let's say, 43 units under our MENA numbers. The numbers, uh, as we've been getting, um, the numbers originally came up for our MENA count to be somewhere in 700. More recently, in a draft they published, we're seeing the number get even higher, close to a, a little over 1,000 for RIMA. Um, so this is going to be a big undertaking in the next two years of identifying sites for future affordable housing units. And if we don't have enough sites available to accommodate RIMA numbers, our housing element has to specify specific areas for rezoning. And the rezoning under this new law will be required to happen within three years. So we'll have to identify those sites if we don't have enough, and then rezone those sites within three years for increased density. And then if we fail to get our housing element adopted on time, if it's late or not certified, then that timing that the three years is allowed is where the rezoning drops down and it's reduced to one year. So. Um, and also the rezone sites must allow for housing development that's 20% lower income housing as a permitted use. And there's no CEQA review and also it would be just limited to objective design standards. So we need to start working on our housing update, our housing element update immediately and make sure that we um, have it certified in time so we get adequate time for anything so that needs to occur. Our, so next step is our draft housing element update. The HCD certification has to, we have to submit by December of 2023. And then once they've given us comments, the city council will have to adopt within 120 days of uh, the HCD certification. So our work plan, um, we're looking at, currently we've been, I've been working with uh, Ben Noble Planning um, on the SB2 grant money that we received for a draft ordinance for objective standards for multifamily. Um, our housing element, I'd like to launch this in January of 2022 and put out a, a request for proposals. And then for SB9, the draft ordinance for single family objective standards, that's something that um, FAMS team is prepared to start helping us with at the onset of the new year. And, uh, have a draft in early 2022. So here's the timeline of what I'm using for the multifamily objective standard. It typically takes any ordinance from the first time we bring it to planning commission to the time we get certified by the Coastal Commission, about six months for that entire process. So what we're looking at for multifamily objective standards and the single family objective standards is likely having adoption by um, the end of summer, early fall, quarter, the third quarter of 2022. And then for the housing element update, that's going to take up to two years. So uh, I think we're going to have our work cut out there in terms of finding space for all the new MENA um, requirements. So I just wanted to bring this forth to you to give an idea of when you see me in January, <laughs> And um, asking when we're starting to move ahead on these endeavors, I wanted to uh, bring you in the loop and also be able to respond to community concerns because that SB9 is being talked about frequently. Um, and with that, that concludes my presentation this evening, and I appreciate your time. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. Council members, any questions for Katie tonight? Okay, seeing none. Oh, Council Member Bertrand. So, since this is the law right now, I guess our current housing element is completely out of date. No, um, right now we're in the fifth cycle of our housing element, and it will be. We, we need to adopt the next housing element. Um, we need to submit it to HCD by December of 2023. So we're in compliance currently, and this to stay in compliance, we'll need to make sure to meet this timeline for 2023. Well, there are 
eight-year cycle. The housing element? No, what I mean is, yeah, we, we have an eight-year cycle on housing elements, but it seems like if we're, I mean, because of these law changes, my question basically is, it seems that certain elements in the housing elements probably are not in compliance with the current law. So right now, our, I would say our zoning code is not up to date with the new laws, but we're not out of compliance. Um, if an application comes in, we'll have to follow, we'll have to um, follow state law, but there's, within SB9, there's no requirement that we have an updated ordinance by a state certain, or, or any updated ordinance, there's no requirement. We, that was different with the um, secondary dwelling units a couple of years back, we did have to, Okay, I got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's just go ahead and go to the public real quick to see if anyone has any comments on this item before we adjourn. Okay, Brooks, I do not see any hands raised on this item, and we don't have any emails. So we'll bring this back to Council, Council Member Bertrand. Yeah, um, Steve, is that you with the Sailor Moon logo? Just trying to understand. That's the picture. Yeah. That's way cool, Steve. Yeah, Steve. That is really cool. I, I wouldn't have known except for my daughter. She had to tell me, not to educate me, excuse me. Council Member Peters? Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I just want to uh, say thank you to Katie for, and uh, you mentioned that uh, Sam's team had, had brought this forward as well, so thank you to both of you. Um, these issues are are why in the last couple meetings I've kind of made a point of bringing up that AMBAG's working on arena numbers and these things are happening. Um, even when I uh, was running for re-election last year, I remember someone said they, they weren't going to vote for me because um, you know, I was I was supporting this idea of destroying single family zoning when really you could just see it coming um, ahead of time that it was happening in the state legislature that there wasn't going to be anything that we could do about this that it was it was headed this way and so I appreciate that you're bringing this forward and I will continue to mention it as well throughout uh, I'm sure my next a couple years uh, on council because I'm pretty much calling it now that the first time someone wants to build a duplex in a place that there used to be a single family home, people are going to crawl out of the woodworks to say that we're destroying their single family neighborhoods. And so I'm just going to keep, uh, you know, mentioning it as, as often as possible that this is happening. Um, there's not a lot that we can do about it. Um, it is important that we address the housing crisis, but at the same time, it's going to be really difficult and, and the way that these things are happening are, are not necessarily within our control. Although we do have opportunities to give feedback, and I think we should as, as often as possible. Um, so again, just thank you so much, uh, Katie and um, our city attorney, Sam. Thank you so much uh, for the, the work that you're doing to bring this to our attention um, and to continue to address these issues as they come forward. Okay. Yeah, one more question there. Oh, please. Yeah, yeah, I, when I was reviewing this, I wrote this down, I forgot to ask uh, Katie. So, I think on 48, we have um, multi-unit housing right now that's sort of um, been, you know, we're supposed to get rid of it, but according to these rules, you can't tear multi-unit housing down now. Yeah, um, there, there is protections of you of not downzoning properties that have existing uh, residential densities. So. so we will have to change our zoning laws for those guys because uh, there was supposed to be a limit and we're supposed to do a bunch of things that time went on, time went, but now that should be taken off, I think. Yes, you know, you bring up a good point. We do have standards in our non-conforming section of our zoning code that um, we're not, that was one section that was not updated in the zoning code update due to uh, needing to work through sea level rise challenges. No. But there are standards tied to the R1 um, for bringing multifamily into compliance. We can right. no longer, we cannot enforce that section of our code because that's not in compliance with state law. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, well that 
brings us to item six on the agenda this evening, which is adjournment. Katie, staff, department heads, council members, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Have a wonderful night, and we'll see you on December 9th, which is going to be a fun day. See you then. Oh, I might be in Denver. Okay. See you later. Thank you very much. Wonderful evening. Goodbye.